very much, colleagues, and can I welcome you all to the uh, 27th meeting of the Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Relations Committee of 2017. I'd like to remind members and members of the public to switch off mobile phones, any members using electronic devices to access committee papers during the meeting should please ensure they are switched to silent. I'm delighted on behalf of the committee to welcome Her Excellency Tina Intelman, the Ambassador of Estonia to the United Kingdom, uh, who is here uh, in, uh, uh, to give evidence to the committee uh, on the occasion of the Estonian Presidency of the Council of the European Union. So I would like to uh, invite the Ambassador to open proceedings with an opening statement and then we will be open to questions from members of the committee. Ambassador. Thank you very much, honourable members of the committee. Uh, let me thank you for, first for inviting me today to, to address you. Uh, Estonia took over the presidency of the European Union uh, on July the 1st, and you may know that uh, it was not in, initially intended to, to happen like that. It was supposed to be the British presidency of the European Union, and we were supposed to follow. But um, we did that uh, because the UK felt that it was uh, not anymore in a position uh, to, uh, to preside over, over Europe. Uh, we are a, a country of 1.4 million people, and, uh, and of course, um, we're, since we're doing the presidency for the first time, we, we really want to, to, um, to uh, perform that presidency to, uh, to a very high standard. Um, in, in, Europe, in, in Estonia, the support for the European Union now stands at around 80%. So fortunately, the government and the civil servants, they have a very, very strong backing at home uh, while performing the, the duties of the presidency. And uh, when we were doing the midterm review of, uh, of these uh, six months, uh, our prime minister has said that we feel that we have been able to build some bridges uh, these, uh, these three or, or four months, which is probably a, a, a good a statement, and um, and a statement that really feel that really reflects the feeling and and the challenges that we had um, uh, during uh, that we have during these these uh, this time. The uh, slogan or, or the theme of the Estonian presidency is unity through balance, and um, and besides building these bridges, I may also say that that you know when we took over the mood about the European Union. Uh, was was uh, was not the best. Uh, there had been the British referendum, and people were asking if, in Europe, in general, we have been we had been doing something wrong, and if we had not been giving the right messages to our people, and if we were losing the the support of the people. And uh, we may say that the mood is changing and has changed quite considerably. I said that in, in Estonia, the support for the European Union stands very high, but we also see that the popularity of the Union in other member states is increasing, and of course, the economy is also growing. Brexit gives us a, a challenge per se in terms of negotiations, but also Brexit gives us for food for thought as to how we, in the format of 27, want to move ahead and which are the avenues of deeper integrations that we want to explore. Uh, President of, of the Commission, Juncker, has made his proposals a couple of months ago, and also uh, the French President Macron has, um, has expressed how see, he sees the future of Europe. So the next two years or so, we will, we will have a very thorough discussion at the level of, of leaders of, uh, of the 27, how to move ahead. In, in, different, uh, in, in different areas like the Eurozone, uh, like internal security, like trade and future financing of the European Union, all very, very vital issues. Um, in, the, in the framework of presidency discussions and presidency um, priorities, we've also said that, that the European citizens need to see tangible results and tangible tangible things from, from Europe. Because if you think about alienation, if you think about citizens taking for granted what they have and not realizing what they're getting from the European Union, this is, this is where you get in trouble. 
So, um, so we have always stressed that the citizens need to see what they get. And we have also stressed that um, the institutional setup is important, but uh, the institutional setup is not the most important of things. Uh, now, let me go into the four pr stated priorities of the Estonian presidency and maybe add some key words to these priority areas. Uh, so it's open and an innovative European economy, safe and secure Europe, digital Europe with a free movement of data, and inclusive and sustainable Europe. First of all, about the, economy, the European economy. I said that the economy is growing. But uh, honorable members of the committee know better than I do that you have to run as fast as you can to stand in one place. But if you want to go to get somewhere, you have to run twice as fast. And this is exactly true about uh, economic development. We just cannot be reassured that the economy is growing right now. The structure of our economies is changing. We have uh, companies like Uber, for instance, we have uh, digital nomads, we have people who, who work and, and, and live in different countries and we, who expect to be in a re relationship with their country while living elsewhere. Um, we also have to talk about strategic investments in Europe, so uh, there needs to be reinforcement of European Fund for Strategic Investments and there needs to be knowledge-based growth and competitiveness. Um, we have also moved ahead through these, throughout these months on, for instance, the how to apply VAT on e-commerce. Issues that are now coming up because of the changes in the structure of, uh, of our economies. Um, concerning, uh, uh, concerning the inclusiveness and sustainability, so that's essentially the, the social agenda of Europe. Um, there is now going to be the proclamation of the European pillar of social rights and, uh, and, uh, and, and you know, a deeper look at the social acquis and also the simplification of social security coordination regulations. People are moving. We have the free movement of people uh, in, within Europe. So we need to look at the social guarantees and how we treat with the rights of, of, of these workers who who move from, from one place to another. The third uh, issue, as I mentioned, is a safe and secure Europe. The, um, the issue of security and the overall in security environment in which we operate is, uh, is, of, uh, of, is of concern. F to us collectively and, and to Estonia in particular, um, we have taken a look at how to explain to people where we stand. So we've created a digital sanctions map. We know that Europe has imposed sanctions. Some of the sanctions are, are linked with the UN Security Council sanctions, but when you know, how do you actually digest that? How do you understand that? So now we have an EU digital sanctions map, which is also somehow, somehow user-friendly. There are now 40 sanctioned regimes currently that are applied, so now we have a, a better look at that. Um, we have, uh, we're looking forward to a launch of permanent structured cooperation. Um, there is a, 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 a clear understanding of, of a defense industrial development program. Uh, we are also tackling continuously with the migration and refugee crisis. This issue has not been solved and is not going to be solved. It's not going to go away but we are better prepared to address that. The migration flows now have significantly reduced this year, and, um, but the pressure will persist. There will be uh, pressure from economic migrants and also pressure from refugees. Um, concerning the security environment, we are now also facing hybrid threats and cyber threats. Um, in Tallinn, for the first time ever, we sat the defense ministers around the table and the NATO Secretary General was also there and we did a, a practical lesson and simulation of how to address the cyber threats and hybrid threats. 
for ministers themselves to kind of to get a better understanding and to give a better understanding in what security and in environment we're, we're living right now. Terrorist threats also, terrorism is not going to go away, but we are much better prepared to, to address this issue. We are uh, reinforcing the exchange of uh, information. And um, of course, you know, the terrorist threats that happen get in the media, but there are so many of them which don't happen and of course we don't know about them. And lastly, the um, Estonian presidency uh, has been referred to as a digital presidency. In Tallinn we held a digital summit to get the message across that the digitalization of our economies is not something that is only done in some countries, is not something that is optional, it is an overall European issue and all leaders need to be committed to it. We're now talking about the digital uh, uh, common market and we feel that maybe we should announce the free movement of data as the fourth freedom of, of, of movement in, in Europe. Uh, uh, there, for instance, you know, in Estonia we have also talked about the digital signature which is in place in, in in Estonia and also in a number of other countries. We feel that this is an avenue for probably all of the Europe. And it's also, we should also see that this digital, so to say, signature and other digital ways of, of interaction with a mem of citizens with a concrete member state, like Estonian citizens with Estonian government. These, some of these ways of interaction should be applied across the board if we really like to talk about integrated Europe. So, in short, these are the issues that the Estonian presidency has been dealing with. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to respond to all questions about Brexit. Brexit is dealt with by the two negotiating teams. It's not a topic for, for the presidency. Of course, we all have a stake in it. It's a, it's a sad issue. Uh, from our side, we want to get through it as smoothly as we can and start looking at the future arrangements. We hope that our relationship with the United Kingdom will be, will be very friendly and strong um, in the future, and I trust that this is the hope of, of all European Union member states. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for that comprehensive opening statement and good morning. Uh, can I open by asking you, I've been looking at the uh, Estonian government's uh, presidency programme and as you have uh, said yourself that uh, the first aspect of that is protecting and promoting the EU's four freedoms, the freedom of movement of goods, persons, services and, and capital. And in terms of actions under that priority, you've outlined that uh, modernising the rules in terms of labour mobility and free movement of persons is a, is a priority for you. In that context, um, what do you think are the um, chances of, of reaching a kind of open uh, trading agreement with the United Kingdom, given that the United Kingdom is very much set against free movement of persons and wishes to remove the country from that? It's, uh, I don't have the crystal ball, unfortunately, with me. I left it in the hotel. <laughs> so uh, uh, nobody has the crystal ball right now uh, about, about this issue. Um, we are very well aware of the fact that that the UK is a, is a very important trading partner. And, um, but at the same time, of course, uh, you know, one cannot stay inside at the, at the same time being outside. If you look at the trade agreements that uh, the European Union has, there are different ways of, of, of dealing with trade. We're not, right now finalizing a, a free trade agreement with Japan. We have uh, a, another one with Canada. We have been negotiating one with, with the US that, uh, that uh, uh, is, is still in the, in the process of, of consideration. These negotiations uh, take quite a long time. Um, and um, and it, it will be a separate process once we uh, agree on, 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 uh, on, on the divorce. Uh, the, the situation is also made more complex uh, because there is no existing 
modality of relationship of, or, or agreement uh, that would be acceptable to the United Kingdom. So there would have to be an, another modality, another, another system, another, another framework, um, and that will take it will take time to, to negotiate it. Yes. What do you think um, the chances are of being able to move on to the next stage of negotiations uh, in December? There would have to be a further movement in terms of uh, financial obligations was quite clearly said in the October Council uh, that uh, in terms of citizens' rights and, uh, and with regards to Ireland, there has been movement. But uh, in, in terms of you know, the financial obligations, the movement has not been su sufficient. We really very much hope that in December we can start with, uh, with the next phase. Internally in the European Union, we are talking now about the arrangements for impossible arrangements for the transition period. We are preparing ourselves, but uh, as we feel it in, in, in Brussels, the, co the, the, the ball is in, in the court of the United Kingdom to, to come up a little bit, you know, to be a little bit more forward coming in terms of financial agreements. It, truth be said, uh, we have taken, with integration is, 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 is very deep. Integrate the levels of integration that that we have uh, we, that we have achieved, and also the financial uh, obligations that we have taken together are quite complex. So um, the 27 um, uh, feel that 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 you know there is there is still room for the UK to move and to be a little bit more forward coming because somebody has to has to carry forward these financial obligations that we have, and they are quite substantive. We have given loans, for instance, and so on. Thank you. And you mentioned transition. Uh, in your view, if, uh, if there isn't a transition uh, agreement um, after uh, March 2019, uh, would freedom of movement have to continue as part of that transition agreement? The, the UK government ha has said that during the tradition uh, period, uh, during the tradition transition period, the freedom of movement would would continue, as I understand it right now, and uh, and that also those European citizens who are here would be welcome to stay here, provided that they register. So this is the, the this is what we what we take it and is is the is the position of the government and uh, and uh, and we will we. We take that information as, as it has come to us. Um, as I said, uh, the modalities of the transition period and, and, the, and the fact whether we in, engage in, in this transition period, it still has to be decided. And uh, we, we like to keep these negotiations between the two negotiating teams because it's beneficial for the UK to have one negotiating partner. And it's also vital for us to stay together as a bloc of 27 and to address every issue that arises within our own group and then go out and, and negotiate. This is unfortunately where we are right now. Uh, thank you. Fin finally, you talked um, both in your opening statement and in your uh, lecture yesterday about uh, your ambitions in terms of e-commerce and uh, Estonia has already got a global reputation as a, as a digital nation. I know that you were talking about cooperation um, with health professionals uh, in this country about e-medicine. What um, are... Is, co is cooperation on these digital matters with the UK made easier or more difficult as a result of Brexit? Um, the issue of digitalisation, let me put it a little bit in a broader perspective. Um, what we see has happened is that private businesses have taken ahead this issue uh, very strongly, globally. And, uh, and, sometimes, and, and then, of course, the private businesses, they are engaging our citizens citizens of all our countries in, uh, in, in e-commerce or, or, or in other activities, in, uh, in Facebook, wherever. You know, our citizens are using the possibilities that have been created by, by private businesses. And now we're starting to see the, 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 the backside of it, that not all is good what our, our citizens are doing 
in this virtual world. And we feel that, that the government haven't, um, haven't uh, stepped up in, in, in their responsibilities and, and, and in taking some role in protecting their citizens and offering their citizens a, a safer uh, environment to operate in that digital world. So that's why the Estonian government is so strong in saying there's a role for government and there's a responsibility for government and for European governments as such. So that's the broader kind of, you know, the the the, the intellectual background of from from which we are coming, and, and that's why we're so you know, we, we we we're just you know speaking about it continuously. Uh, in terms of e-health, we have uh, had an exchange of views yesterday. Uh, we feel that there is a, a a possibility for us to to work together because Scotland has. Um, has uh, developed quite considerably in, in this respect, and we have also con developed considerably, but there are different different aspects where we could benefit from each other. Um, whether uh, this future cooperation is, is made uh, less or, or, or more possible, I think this cooperation is, is possible. I don't really think that, that um, the fact that you are exiting the European Union um, Makes it uh, makes it makes it impossible. Probably we, we just have to find other aspects of it. Clearly, what we decide within the European Union in terms of you know, digital uh, uh, digital common market or or the free movement of data, clearly uh, you would not be uh, you would not be uh, automatically associated to that. Okay, thank you. I'll pass on to Louis McDonald now. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I, I, I was struck by the themes of your presidency around an open and innovative European economy, a safe and secure Europe, and also a digital Europe and the free movement of data. These are all themes that are very important to the United Kingdom and to Scotland, as well as to Estonia and to the European Union. <coughs> I wonder if, um, again, in a sense, reflecting the convener's questions around the issue of safety and security. Clearly, there are live and present uh, dangers in the world at the moment which affect the UK as much as the rest of the European Union. Uh, can I ask, in developing safety and security policy within the European Union, you've talked about some of the things already initiated under the Estonian presidency, uh, how far is it possible to maintain a uh, connection with the UK as a, a key partner facing many of the same threats uh, and many of the same risks in the wider world, whether that be cyber security, uh, political interference from uh, foreign powers are, are, are indeed the threats of, of terrorism. It is in our interest to, to keep um, cooperating with the, with the UK very closely, and the UK government has said exactly the same. Um, they have said that they would continue uh, participating in, in EU uh, missions abroad, um, and, uh, and also they would be uh, interested in exchanging data and, and, and in setting up different frameworks. But probably there would have to be an, an, uh, an, an additional uh, agreement about some of the aspects. So the interest is very much there because I think our common threats are, 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 are there and we have, uh, we have analyzed them and we, have <clears throat> we understand that we, we are stronger when we face them together. But probably there would also have to be different uh, different agreements uh, concluding in different parts. There's been quite a lot of concern lately around particularly interference by Russia and its agencies in uh, political processes in Spain and Britain and other parts of the world in the United States, and also um, uh, the, their presence online and the, the, the threat of digital uh, uh, warfare, I think somebody described it as the other day, uh, or certainly uh, digital aggression uh, in interfering in the internal affairs of other countries. Clearly, when you pull together defence ministers from the European Union to discuss cyber security, uh, those kind of issues are, will be on the agenda. Could you say a little more about how we can work together more effectively? Uh, I, I know, for example, that a government in Estonia is very integrated electronically, which must be hyper-efficient uh, uh, most of the time, but clearly carries with it a security risk. And I wonder if you could say more about uh, the, the, those issues around security. Yes. Uh, we, we like to talk about digital threats, and uh, you know, that allegedly are, some of them at least, you know, are emanating from, from Russia. There's another issue that I want to put on record. It's a propaganda. And uh, we see that European... Um, 
uh, publics are, are quite vulnerable to, to this uh, propaganda or alternative facts or distortion of facts. So there's clearly space for us, for politicians of all European countries to be more aware of this issue also. Concerning uh, digital security, cyber security, we like to talk about also cyber hygiene. So um, uh, as I said, people are now doing things on the, on the internet, sometimes totally unaware of, of, uh, of basic methods or, or basic things that they would have to do uh, to protect themselves. Um, when, you, uh, you know, when you do your internet banking, you should log out afterwards, you know, this you know, but there are certain things that people do not know because nobody has, nobody has told them so. And the private companies that have offered them these possibilities have never said that people would be vulnerable because the private companies are interested in people just using. They are not there to, 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 to give lessons or, or to teach people. So, so that's one of the things where governments certainly, certainly have a role to play. Fortunately now, cybersecurity is being addressed on international level, not only at the level of the European Union, but also in NATO, very strongly. The United Kingdom is, is part of NATO. In the, uh, um, in the OSCE, also in, um, in the United Nations. So it's a global concern, global issue. The United, within the United Nations, uh, uh, there is a, 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 a talk about uh, creating this, uh, you know, a piece of international law that governs that uh, area of, uh, of, of activity. International law is necessary, sure. even if uh, people do not abide by it, and, uh, and even if there is a certain amount of confusion. If there is no international law, there is no base of base of rules uh, that we can show to those who violate those rules, right? So, um, so in, in all of these spheres, we, uh, we hope that we can work together with the United Kingdom. We have been working together. Um, let me just uh, say that we are also very, very grateful to, to UK for, for leading the boots, uh, uh, the, the exercise of, of boots on the ground in, in Estonia. Um, the, and the, the British uh, uh, military uh, 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 personnel who, who are in Estonia are, are a, a great asset to us and, and we're really very, very grateful for, for that also. It's, it's the physical security boots on the ground, but it's also the cooperation in, in facing cyber threats that makes us stronger together in NATO. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Tavish Scott. Thank you. So I wonder if I could carry on that line of questioning from Lewis MacDonald about, as you say, the physical security. Russia is your biggest concern as a country? Uh, Russia is a big concern, but not only for us. Mm. It's a concern for the Western world, uh, for us jointly. Uh, Russian activities have become uh, unpredictable, and um, Russia, as we all remember, has taken, has occupied part of uh, our territory of, of Ukraine, mm -hmm. the, these actions are totally unacceptable to, for us. Thank you. The reason I ask is that in, I, I represent Shetland, very far north of, of uh, these islands and indeed of Europe, and we are seeing the Ministry of Defence, the UK Ministry of Defence, reinstalling a radar dome to keep an eye on aggressive military behaviour by the Russians, both in the air and in, in, in sea, uh, and the Ministry of Defence explained that in pretty uh, worrying terms uh, in recent days. Um, I wonder what your presidency conceives of the development of an EU defence force, because there's some discussion about that as opposed to the role of NATO. Do you, have you a view as to how that um, concept will become a reality or, or where that debate will lead in the next six months during your presidency? European Union defence cooperation is deepening. It's, it's a fact. There is... Um, there is a, a clear uh, common understanding that, that this needs to develop. Of course, uh, it is not at the expense of NATO. We uh, believe in, in, in very strong NATO in Article 5 and in, in, in the value of, of, of very robust cooperation within NATO and, and in keeping very clear the why NATO stands and why, why NATO is there, why NATO was created. It's a, it's a defence alliance. And the EU, but the EU Defence Force, in whatever way that deepens, uh, do, you, do you foresee a role, as Lewis MacDonald was asking, for the United Kingdom in that, in, in terms of partnerships? 
Yes, we, we very much hope that the UK will, will be in partnership with the EU with, in that. Do you, what do you think will happen in the next six months on that agenda? Is that part of your presidency's uh, particular objectives or particular work streams? Uh, yes, some of, some of it will... Uh, I, I think that, you know, the more deeper, more deeper uh, discussion about, about that will happen in the next six months during the Bulgarian presidency. But it's, it's quite clear, as I said, that there is a common will to, to deepen defence cooperation. Um, as, I, as I said, there is a, this um, a, a, a permanent uh, structured cooperation, and also the, uh, there are discussions on the European Defence Industrial Development Programme. Um, it, it, is, it is going ahead. Mm, thank you. The, the final question I wanted to ask, you made a point there about propaganda. Do you have a view of Russia today as an arm of Kremlin propaganda in, in this country? Yes, we have a view uh, about Russia today as, as Kremlin, view, Kremlin arm of propaganda. Mm. Thank it's you. exactly what it is. Thank you very much. Thank you. Jackson Carlo. Uh, good morning. Uh, Your Excellency, I'm not sure in the last session of our parliament here, I'm not, uh, forgive me, I'm not sure if it was your predecessor or whether it was a minister from the government came over and uh, spoke at a lunch here in the Scottish parliament. I was really quite evangelical about the paperless, the digital uh, infrastructure that has been established in Estonia. And it was quite fascinating to see what has been achieved and how many platforms and agencies and ways in which the government has managed to embrace this. And I'm interested, I mean, um, one attack on our national health service here, uh, digital attack, paralyzed hospitals all over the country. And I just wonder whether there have been any attempts, uh, therefore, to try and paralyze the infrastructure in Estonia. Uh, what systems and how able you are to respond to that? And whether having this much deeper and broader uh, digital platform that the public interface with in so many different ways has led to a much deeper awareness within citizens of their own personal security and needs to be cautious and to act. Um, because, I, again, in this country, I think there is a, a, a very considerable concern about the lack of awareness and naivety of many people in terms of the way that they engage. And I'd be interested to know, in a country which is much more developed in this regard than perhaps we are here, how you're responding to that and whether or not you have faced attempts to uh, undermine your structure. We experienced massive cyber attacks coupled with riots in the streets uh, around 10 years ago. This is when we started talking about cyber attacks and cyber warfare, and we, um, we know where these attacks originated from. So, um, so uh, sadly, we are leaders. We are leaders in this respect because we uh, we saw what can happen. Uh, none of our, our systems was was damaged uh, irreparably. Uh, but but this is why we started ringing the the alarm bell, saying uh, saying that uh, we need to we need to work on international law and we also need to work on practical measures. There's a lot of awareness. NATO has established, or we. Together, NATO members have established a, a cybersecurity uh, center in Tallinn, where we are dealing specifically with these issues. The awareness in Estonia is is quite high, uh, but of course, you know, me as as a simple consumer, um, I am quite mm, quite stupid uh, if I compare myself with with people who are who are experts and, and knowledgeable. So that's why also the the government is taking responsibility, of course, of, of all of these paperless environment, because essentially Estonian citizen is interacting with the state uh, through digital means, setting up, uh, you know, paying the taxes, uh, setting up a company. Um, we have these, you know, interacting with, uh, with the health, looking into the health records, or doing what, whatever. I mean, you just cannot imagine going to an office anymore because you you just log on the computer. You use your digital ID, and um, and it's it's a safe environment that we have created with different passwords and so on. And 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 you know, this is how we do business. There is, as I said, there is awareness, uh, but of course. Nothing is 100% safe. Also, when I walk in the street, it's not 100% safe because I may be run over by a car accidentally or on purpose. Uh, that doesn't mean that we are going to ban the cars. This is progress. So we need to face the threats that we have um, 
but we cannot stand in the, in the, on, the, on the way of progress. And that's exactly the thing that, that, that Silicon Valley is always there. People come up with new solutions and, and, peop and, and, and citizens are, our citizens of our states are using these solutions. So, uh, you know, the progress is there. And if the government shuts the eyes, it's, it's no benefit for, for, for anybody. So there is, there is awareness, uh, uh, but a lot remains to be done. We're dealing with that systematically systematically uh, um, on, on, on a daily basis. And I'm sure it is an area that, irrespective of the future relationship, we will want to ensure that there's the strongest cooperation on. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, because the cyber world is, 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 not, uh, is, is not made of, of, of compartments. There's not a compartment for Estonia and another compartment for, for the UK. Our citizens are all there together. Just the one other point was, that when uh, your colleague was here, we of course discussed the really quite advanced links that exist between Scotland and Estonia, particularly in Tallinn, where there is a, a considerable uh, entrepreneurial exchange in terms of business links and cooperation. And where stands that today? And uh, can I say in, in passing that whatever the future relationship, that, uh, you can be assured that everybody here will be doing everything we can to ensure that that very productive relationship that has existed between Scotland and Estonia, and particularly the business community in Tallinn, continues. The relationship is really very good, and um, uh, business relationship is, is never it's never enough. So uh, there are there are ways of, of deepening these relationships, and then ways of of, of exchange that 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 I intend to look into as as ambassador for sure and uh, and i and i hope that also businesses are doing the same yesterday we inaugurated a, a new honorary consul here who is um, who is who has a digital company and um, and and who is a, who will be a, a very active honorary consul i'm sure in in looking into strengthening these ties um, i'm also happy that part of our a uh, hundred years uh, celebration. Next year, we're celebrating a hundred years of the Estonian state. Uh, so, a big part of these cultural celebrations are going to happen in Scotland over the next year. So, we are very much for cooperating with Scotland and maintaining good relations. We look forward to that. Thank you very much, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, Ambassador. Um, certainly, as you stated earlier, um, uh, Estonia took over the presidency uh, six months. Uh, prior to your original planning, uh, how easy was that to uh, to deliver? Well, of course, there were moments of panic, uh, uh, but um, but we decided that uh, yeah we would do it. There was a, a discussions in uh, in um, a, a, in Brussels, and then it was decided that for somebody else to to step in at a, a short notice would would have been even even more difficult. Uh, of course, uh, it is the, the, we are losing some of the moment of grandeur because it was supposed to be that we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Estonian state together with taking the presidency and, and uh, you know, we're concert, there were all these activities that were planned, so we need to, we need, we, we needed to plan them differently. But overall, uh, Overall, I, I hope that uh, that we are managing, and I hope that our presidency is being appreciated. And uh, and um, December is, is approaching fast. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, you also earlier on you stated um, in terms of the theme uh, for your presidency is uh, unity through balance. Now, obviously, in recent months uh, we discussed some uh, events uh, within the EU earlier this morning, but obviously the, there was the the referendum that took place in. Uh, Catalonia, and the, the, the subsequent violence took place against people who were attempting to vote. Um, do you think, uh, well, uh, in your opinion, do you think that was actually a, a balanced, um, a balanced approach from the Spanish government to uh, to citizens who wanted to express their democratic right? Uh, of course, we all know uh, we are not living in the perfect world but we are aspiring towards being perfect. Um, European Union is, is made up of, uh, of mature democracies, 
and we trust each other and we do think that each of these democratic countries is prepared to address the issues that arise in, in their countries. And, um, and, and also we, we feel that we should give each other the opportunity to and the time to, to address these issues. In Estonia, most certainly in Estonia, we, uh, would, we would hope that, that people in Brussels and other member states, if we had a difficult situation, gave us the opportunity to address uh, our situation ourselves. And also, if we're looking at the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union because you feel, or at least part of your population feels, that uh, Brussels uh, tells you too many things or orders you too many things to do is too prescriptive. So, so that's why also we, we trust that the Spanish government has all the means to address the situation um, on its territory. Mm. Uh, but certainly, th th there has been a, a great deal of, um, of concern um, raised by, uh, by many politicians, not just here, but certainly elsewhere as well, just regarding the, uh, the events that took place, uh, particularly around the violence. Uh, and that certainly, um, I think, it probably hasn't done um, the European Union uh, a lot of good. There's probably been a lot of concern raised about the, the EU's position um, in terms of not wanting to encourage dialogue you know, between the two sides. Do you think that's a, a fair, a fair um, summation? I, uh, I, I know that uh, now the Spanish government has decided that there would be a, a, another election in, in Catalonia, which I, I, I feel is, is very much you know, within, uh, within the, the, the democratic means that, that uh, Spanish or any government can, uh, can use in, uh, in, in these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ross Greer. Convener, I've got um, follow-up questions to both uh, Jackson Carroll and, and Tavish Scott's line of questioning. Um, my understanding is that over the last 10 years or so, or perhaps longer, um, electronic voting has grown considerably um, to the point where I believe around 30% of your population now, now uh, e-vote. E Obviously, in that same period of time, the risk of cyber attack, particularly on European and Western democracies and democratic processes, has increased. How do you ensure the integrity of an electronic voting system? And has there been any debate around whether that's sustainable in light of recent events in other democracies? Um, there, there are continuous discussions about the electronic voting, but not towards uh, eliminating it, but towards keeping it very secure. We have now had, yeah, 10 years of, uh, of electronic voting in different elections, including the elections to the European Parliament. And, uh, and there is the overall support of, of population towards that means, because if you do not allow that, you know, people are, not used, people are now used to it. Right? You take it for granted. You know, I was, uh, before uh, being posted uh, to, um, to, to London as, a, as Estonian ambassador, which is a big privilege, um, I served uh, in West Africa. And uh, I cast my vote from my desk in, in, in West Africa. And I take it as, as my right. So taking this right away from citizens would, uh, would, um, uh, would not be nice. And then people would not appreciate that. So while knowing all the risks, we are still pursuing with that, and uh, we feel that the system that we have established is uh, safe enough. Thanks. And um, following Tavish Scott's point around defence, and Russia today was raised as an example of uh, propaganda and disinformation. Um, obviously, the issue around disinformation and propaganda campaigns cannot be solved by installing new radar stations, for example. No. How, how do we tackle that? How do we tackle these very direct attempts to pump alternative facts, false news, etc., into the European debate? Well, there has to be, uh, first of all, there has to be recognition that this is happening. And then there has to be, uh, um, I, I frankly think that politicians have a role in it. And um, in, in explaining and, and, and in bringing forward these issues and, and also I think that the media has a, has a role, role to play. We, uh, uh, by, by being very open, um, 
and and believing that the the end of history is 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 near i think that we have uh, we have become a little bit careless about what is happening in our societies would it be a mistake for european politicians to normalize these outlets as if they are legitimate media outlets compared to to our own to uh, to to legitimize these to, outlets as if they are comparable to say the the bbc or or any of your uh, broadcasters would it be a mistake for a european politician to act as if Russia today is comparable to a free Western media outlet? Well, it, uh, it very much depends on, uh, on the collective and, and personal judgment of, uh, of, uh, of politicians in each and every member state, or in each and every country, thereby. Thank you. With that, I'd like to... So, sorry. Uh, well, very quickly. Thank you. Um, it was really, you mentioned in your opening remarks about the pillar of social rights. Um, I'm a member of the Committee of the Regions where we adopted our position on that uh, a couple of months ago. And it was really just to get your thoughts on how you think that we can, how, especially at a European level, how we can address the social inequalities. Because obviously I think that national governments will have their own policies uh, regardless, which will, uh, will affect that. Um, I, yeah, how you see that that can be done at a European level, and does that involve specific EU-funded programmes to try and tackle that in individual areas, or how will that be done? So, how to even up the uh, uh, yeah, and to try and prevent or at least do something about, positive to tackle the social inequalities that exist between the member states and, and across Europe. Well, certainly, it will take some time. And, uh, and we see that this is happening, but it's also part of, of uh, like, uh, normal economic processes, right? Because, you know, when, uh, uh, when some of the European Union members, the present member states joined, they were uh, slightly at a, at a lower level of, uh, of wealth. Um, but, but also there are different, uh, different ways of, uh, of addressing issues. For instance, there is this uh, posting, uh, uh, posting of workers directive that was, that was uh, adopted recently. So you know, to, to also see what, what kind of effects um, the, the free movement of, of persons and, and workers, so these are workers, uh, has. Uh, for instance, this posting of workers directive I I I involves involves the, the groups of people who come from one member state to another and then basically are there temporarily and are hired under the conditions of, of that other member state from, from where they come. So there has to be a certain limitation and then certain rules applied to that also. So there are different we, may, means of dealing with that, but there is no magic solution that would change the situation from one day to another. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, can I thank uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Intelman for giving evidence to us today. And I'll now close the meeting. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.